park upstairs. We have some refreshments out, and we'll have a few more after the talk. Um, but Ed grew up, as he said, in a French-Canadian blue-collar family um, in Waterville, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, this gentleman asked me if that was um, Waterville in that painting right there. Yeah. Yeah, he did. So. Anyway, without further further ado, I'll let him know. Well, I uh, I don't I guess I'll just begin at the beginning, where, you know, which is when I was a kid. I guess it's going to be a long night. <laughs> a long time ago. Uh, I think one of the critical things in my work are the influences that I had uh, growing up, and one of them was my mom, right there, who's in the front row. Uh, I mean, I know all moms are, are influential on their children, but I remember uh, her painting in the, in the kitchen, and my dad painting in the kitchen, and my grandfather uh, always whittling something and doing some sort of woodworking or or creating little dancing men with sticks. And, I mean, there's always a creative process going on somewhere in our, in our family. And so, uh, actually, I remember my mom painting some, some very small uh, narrative paintings, actually. And I have one at my house right now of a, of a guy shooting uh, a buffalo off of a, from a horse. It's probably, a, I don't know, probably a Gatlin painting or something like that. And, um, and I think those sorts of Thing. Those sorts of influences have influenced the direction that my work has taken as a mature artist. Um, and then various um, various people from that time on have influenced my work as well. Uh, people like Jerome Witkin at Syracuse University, Carolyn Shute, uh, for that matter, after I read her uh, book, The Beans of Egypt, Maine, uh, in, my, uh, in between uh, my first and second year of graduate school. And because uh, it was kind of interesting, actually, that I read that book and it was so pivotal, pivotal because uh, growing up in, in this French-Canadian uh, family, which I, I think is in, in these paintings, actually, um, I knew what I wanted to paint, but until I read that book, I really didn't know how to paint it. And, and I just, she just literally wrote, wrote about the, you know, the, the beads of Egypt name. I don't know how many of you have read that book, but she just literally told it like no one had ever told it before. And I said, the heck with it, I'm gonna just paint it like no one's ever painted it before. So I started out with these various stories that my grandfather told me. Uh, and then it's just transformed into various uh, uh, stories from the newspaper, like this sort of thing, from pop culture, to very personal and very tragic stories as well. So um, I think, I don't know if you want me to go around the room and talk about each individual painting. I can. Um, uh, and it will take a while. But <laughs> there, are, there are more paintings upstairs, some big ones, actually, some big influential ones. Um, influential in the sense that um, they're, they're so, they're so, um, they, they, they tend to combine, I think, especially the pieces upstairs, they tend to combine my love of abstract expressionism. People like Jackson Pollock, de Kooning, uh, and my love of the figure and storytelling all at the same time. So it's uh, I'm a pretty lucky guy to be able to have all these influences and to have this combination of painterliness is a word that artists tend to throw around a lot, uh, but still tell a story and a narrative at the same time. So. Um, that being said, I know that a few people have questions about some of the stories here. I know that even though they are narratives, uh, I actually like people to develop their own stories based on what I'm trying to say, actually. I, I very rarely explain what I'm painting, but I, I, you know, I, I can't do that if, if, uh, if people seem to like it, so I'll go ahead. Like in this particular piece, uh, I, you know, and you have to remember that some of this is not necessarily uh, all, all true stories. I mean, some of it is made up. Some of it is, uh, like I said, from, from pop culture as well. But in this particular piece, I think we, we, uh, we lived in a place called, um, what was it called? Deer Hill is what it was called. My mom's up here laughing <laughs> for a while. Uh, and and we, uh, 
there were these people called the Frenches, and they were they lived in the mountains there, and they they would uh, jack deer, they would hunt and jack deer, and, they, and that's how they made their they made their living. Essentially, it was hunting deer illegally, and there was always something being stolen, or always something you know, snowmobile being stolen, or or you know. Uh, Deer hanging in the in the yard illegally for a, a long time. All of a sudden, one would show up in the middle of the night or something. You know, so I mean, we we live in Maine, so we know what this is like and, and about. But they were very influential, and I mean, I was 11 years old when I lived not far from them. So um, I think this is probably where some of this comes from. And I also think that just the absurdity of the stories that exist in Maine uh, lend themselves really well to the painterly process. Okay, uh, and I also think I've had people come up to me though and say, uh, "I feel really guilty because I'm laughing at your paintings." <laughs> <laughs> and then in the next breath they're saying, "But they're so tragic," and that leads me to believe. So then I start associating myself with Shakespeare. So, so, uh, <laughs> so that's not bad company because when I look at one of Shakespeare's plays, um, I, I find that that kind of uh, that kind of tragic yet humorous thing can really kind of take place all at the same time. And I don't see why it can't happen in painting. Uh, and so there's no particular story to this per se, other than the fact that I love the idea that this guy, uh, you know, stole a quarter of wood, probably to heat his house for the winter, and the police got wind of it and chased him, and of course he went to the refuge of, of the church. Right? That's where we all go, I guess. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, and, in, and in, you know, that's, this is an old painting. By the way, a lot of these pieces range, the, t the time, the dates range from uh, the late 80s up till now. Well, I, I was wondering about that too, because the policemen look like they're mounted Canadian. Are they? You know, I never really thought of it that way. Uh, you know, to tell you the truth, when I'm painting these paintings, I'm in almost a state of, uh, I'm in total bliss. So I totally forget, in essence, what I'm painting some of the time. And I, you know, I know that that's uh, going to be probably, hopefully, a fairly successful painting. But if, if yeah, this guy looks like, yeah, this was probably a, a double, you know, over the border kind of thing, you know? <laughs> Very pragmatic here, <laughs> but I, I think uh, I had one particular painting. It's up. Uh, where's Busy Ridge? Is that around somewhere that's in storage? I think. Yeah, yeah. I did. Well, like, it's a painting of a flipped over. That was that was the first. I think it's in the catalog actually, and it was the first narrative painting that I ever did, and I did it uh, just after graduate school in about 1986, and uh, it ended up being in the biennial in Baltimore, the Baltimore Museum. And I'll never forget that when I went to the opening one night, uh, there was this guy standing there looking at it with his girlfriend, and they were discussing uh, what it might have been about. And they were arguing, he thought it was about the Russian Revolution. And what, it really, what it really was, was uh, a story my grandfather told me of uh, uh, two guys on a pump car in the middle of the, uh, towards uh, midwinter, they got hit by a plow train, and they were left there in the snow, um, uh, and they couldn't be recovered until spring because there's so much snow up in Hola, where she was born, actually. And uh, in that way, they it just had this really sense of like scattered body parts and and uh, various uh, you know pieces of equipment from the from the train tracks and, and that sort of thing. So. They, they thought it was the Russian, or he at least thought it was the Russian Revolution, which is perfectly fine. You know, I love Dr. Chewbacca, too. Uh, and, and, and movies have played a huge role in my work. Uh, uh, television has played a huge role in my work. And that particular piece up there, the shortcut, I don't know if you remember, but uh, the, the, uh, the TV show um, Sky King. Uh, maybe some of you aren't old enough or, you know, but uh, uh, Sky King was, a, a, I don't think it was on very long, but uh, I remember it being, uh, you know, taking place and having, you know, in my imagination at least, I remember someone being lost in the woods who would fly over Montana for you young people. It was a TV show about this ranger that would fly over Montana uh, and save people, and that's where that idea came from, essentially.
Okay. Uh, the particular piece back there, the orchard, uh, comes from the, the jacking people up on Deer Hill, actually, where um, where we, we lived on this huge 500-acre farm when I, was, when I was a kid. And the fields tended to look like that. And I remember people showing up with their pickup trucks and just, you know, shining them on the deer and taking them down, essentially. So I literally have put these sorts of stories into in paint, okay? So uh, beyond that, uh, the, the piece behind Phil over there is a piece that um, it, it was in a different vein in the sense that it comes from when I was a little kid. Uh, we lived uh, up above the Kennebec River and I uh, could hear the trains smashing together at night and I always thought it was, um, I always thought it was, you know, crazy dancing people out in the, in the mountains, you know, banging on drums or something. And so as I got older, I decided that I would do a drawing, and I had the drawing, and when Karen asked me to, this is one of the newer pieces, this is kind of like a new wall over here, and when Karen asked me to put together this show, it was one of the pieces that I went into my archives, and I pulled out one of the, one of, what I think is one of my best drawings uh, of this imaginary uh, group of people dancing around a fire. Uh, along the railroad cars, uh, mm -hmm. along the Kennebec River, and this side being Waterville or Fairfield, and the other side being being Winslow. So um, I'm also really big on taking what I think is local identity and having it turned into a universal idea as well. Uh, I really love that whole thing. I find and I feel as though that if I dig deep enough, if I go into into my childhood and I see myself jumping onto the bed in my pajamas. That uh, and I can still hear those guys dancing, or the sounds of the trains clanging together, and, and, the, and the people dancing by the fire. That it, it really can become like a universal idea for most people when they make their own stories. So, and then uh, the piece uh, next to it is just a, it's an homage to uh, Tom Thompson, one of my favorite Canadian painters. Um, I I just I just loaded it up with a, a lot of nice uh, color and. Uh, and silhouettes, so very similar to the pieces that he does. If you don't know his work, you should check his, his pieces out. I think they're really wonderful, uh, really wonderful pieces that, that he, used to, he used to go into the mountains in Canada and just do them right on the spot in a canoe. And wasn't he found dead in a canoe or something like that, Chris? Have you, you heard that story? <laughs> So, uh, and then the, the, the piece behind Phil, I have, no, I have no idea where that comes from. <laughs> no, I, I think that uh, once again, it probably ties into television, actually, and ties into the Sky King era, uh, in the sense that uh, I, I think pop culture has played a huge role in really my development, you know, television especially. Um, I love movies, I love television. And another influence, actually, um, is, um, is on, on a certain level, is Andrew Wyeth, I think, in the sense that uh, the way he makes marks with his paintings are really phenomenal. And I think uh, some of them, like I, if you notice some of the pieces I scratch into the, into the pieces, or I'll do an underpainting, and then I'll, if you look at the SOS up there, it's scratched into. So I'll do a, a dark under layer, and then I'll scratch into it to create a positive space. And I learned that from him. So I'm kind of stealing from a lot of people. You know? Another influence is Philip Gustin. I don't know if you know who he is, but you should check him out if, if you don't know who he is. Uh, he does these sort of, I'm sure you've seen them, these sort of large Ku Klux Klan sorts of uh, guys smoking cigarettes and driving in cars and that sort of thing. I, I think there is a certain naivete to my work as well. Uh, I, I think there's a certain, um, uh, even though I'm a trained, you know, professional painter, I think there's a certain kind of uh, clunkiness in a way that's kind of gives its own, uh, lends itself to what I call handwriting. Okay, and if I look at my handwriting, I can see that my handwriting is literally like I paint. It's kind of an interesting correlation. Yeah. Yes. I just wondered whether you ever written down in the younger years some of the stories. Originally, because I, when I when I see some of your paintings, I think, well, he could also be a writer. 
Well, I, yeah, I, I think it. I, well, Karen's actually asking to write a few down so that she can, when people come in here, she can kind of talk to people about the basis for them. So I never really have written them down fully, uh, but I, I, it certainly has crossed my mind. Uh, and then, you know, various pieces like this piece here is just a piece that I did. Uh, it, it's, it's sort of a, a takeoff of when my nephew was, was uh, it's, a new paint, it's a new painting, but it's, but it's based on a, a time when my nephew was, my sister was in labor for her son Judson, and she was in labor for him ever. And so I, uh, so I, I just took it. Was in Blue Hill, and so I took off in the car, and I just went out and drew, drew blueberry barons. Uh, and so you never know where a piece is going to take, you know, take fruition. Uh, and so, and then this video piece, the newest piece that I have, is uh, obviously based. Well, I think it's obvious. I don't know. It's it's called um, uh, Steamboat Wharf Incident, and and I was just absolutely fascinated by the guys on the Tinicus. Um, and and what they did out here, and how they you know shoot each other and, and everything else, and have these what are called lobster wars, and it's also based on a book called Lobster Wars as well. Um, so it could be loosely fit into many people uh, or many lobstermen on the coast. It doesn't necessarily have to be these specific guys because these guys they're they're all fighting. It seems like. Uh, but anyway, it, so this is a piece, an example of, of the pop culture pieces that, that I uh, talked about as well. So I have three or four different veins going on. I mean, I have the old uh, Sky King, you know, which the, the shoes, the snowshoes fall into, the orange hat next to it, my grandfather influence, uh, hiking with him, crossing barbed wire out on, you know, snowy fields. That's him up there uh, with the, um, with the, the uh, dowsing, the dowsing thing, uh, and I just I love gold paint. I use gold for a lot of other paintings, <laughs> but I decided to put it as a top paint there. And then I love also Saint Sebastian. That's Saint Sebastian below there. And I also have a big painting which is in the catalog. It isn't here tonight, but it's it's called The Hunted, and it's uh, it's it's really uh, taking the, the story of Saint Sebastian, the, the the martyr that was loaded with tons of arrows. And, uh, and he was uh, strapped to a, in, in art history, he's strapped to a marble pole. But in this video case, I decided to strap St. Sebastian the Game Warden to a, to a tree. And I, have, and I have these guys with bows and arrows and cans of beer and dead, uh, you'll see in the catalog, and dead deer. Uh, so so I, I kind of take from all over the place. Um, any questions? What's upstairs? What's upstairs? Oh, I have I have a couple of huge pieces up there. I have, there's some older pieces up there actually. Uh, I love painting nocturnes. I love painting night paintings. And one of them up there is called uh, Death of a Young Man, and it's one of my more serious pieces. And it's based essentially on the cat. I can tell you the catalyst was when Charlie Howard, Howard was thrown over the the bridge. That was the catalyst. But the result was an homage to my father, who died at age 40. And so, uh, and he essentially got thrown over the bridge, as far as I'm concerned. That's the kind of the serious part of my, of my work. And so, I kind of, you know, we were living in Baltimore at the time, and Charlie Howard was thrown over that bridge. I mean, he made, you know, international blues, and I was just blown away by that. So I went upstairs to my studio, and I just did that painting. And then there's a, another one up there uh, called Humbagog, and it's uh, a guy standing like this with his rifle and holding a Bible at the same time. And that came from a Carolyn, uh, uh, from a uh, Joyce Carol Oates novel. A little short story where a guy would go into the woods and just read to nothingness or to everything, whichever way you want to look at it. And Joyce Car I don't read Joyce Carol Oates anymore. Uh, <laughs> She's a great writer, but she's a little scared. <laughs> uh, and and uh, I mean, I've seen her speak, and I mean, I, I used to really admire her work. She's a Syracuse grad, you know, alum and all that sort of thing. But it just, it just, her work is so, uh, you know, just so powerful. I can't read it anymore. But that particular piece is where that comes from. And then uh, there are a couple of other pieces up there. A guy up uh, called uh, there's a piece called uh, Percival's Land. Which Percival, of course, is Baxter State Park. It was named after Mr. Baxter, and there's some guys on there, uh, on their snowmobile, just chasing a couple of deer. 
Um, and then I have a few compost piles, compost pieces, which um, you know people tend to, to like. I, I, I'm kind of a split personality. I have kind of my have very abstract stuff, my pine needle paintings, my, my uh, compost paintings, and then I have all of this narrative work, which Karen really kind of helped me bring back to, to, to fruition. And people have been asking, can you do a bunch of you know, narrative paintings? Alan Stubbs is a big fan. So, uh, but anyway, you know, there ended up being roughly, I don't know, I have about 35 or 40 pieces in this place. So there's a lot of work here. And it's, it's almost like a little mini retrospective in a sense for me. And it's always, you know, it's always surprising and somewhat humbling, I guess, to step back and look at roughly 25 years worth of work and realize that, hmm, maybe I have accomplished a little bit, you know, uh, and hopefully it will influence other artists down the line. So. Yes, Karen. So I, what I find so fascinating one of the things about your paintings is the different perspectives that you choose, and I wondered if you could talk about yeah. about how you choose. Yeah, you mean like the God's eye view? Are you feeling like the God's eye, the bird's well, eye view? Well, from here, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, then, and then, you know, like from the community. Yeah, there's a lot of height to my paintings. Uh -huh. Um, I, my mentor in graduate school, we, we would talk about that. I wasn't necessarily doing these. I did these starting after graduate school, but she would ask me about that, and I had no real answer. I, I think uh, it's just the way I see. It's just part of my process. I was actually having a little trouble with this particular piece, actually, because uh, I, didn't, I didn't really want that bird's eye view. Uh, you know, necessarily, I wanted people to feel kind of uh, taken into the whole uh, situation, the whole environment, you know. But some of these other bigger pieces, it's almost as though I am that guy in Sky King. <laughs> and I think that's where that comes from. Yeah. I'm the game board with the arrows. <laughs> Well, you know, Ed, your portrait, you're holding your paintbrushes and they look like arrows from a farm. Yeah, there you go, see? <laughs> metaphor, it's all metaphor. Yes? Before he was on TV, Sky King was on the radio, and I yeah. used to listen to that in the late 40s. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I don't remember that. <laughs> yes, sir? I wouldn't go into that myself, but uh, what's the story on the truck walking into the bushes of it? The truck in the bushes. On the oh, on the oh, on the oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, oh, yeah. Another, another, another influence. Yeah, that's. Uh, are you ready for this one? No, no. Yeah, uh, uh, Stephen King. Yeah. Well, I love. I love this whole. I love this whole relationship with uh, animals paying back humans for the ills that they do to to them. You know, so I thought, I thought Cujo, and I, and I thought, uh, and my, my brother-in-law is a former, well, his family is, they're lobstermen. I have something for lobstermen, I guess. But, uh, I mean, it's, lobster is such an icon of this state, you know, and I, I, I kind of like to poke a few holes into those icons a little bit. And, and I think that after I read or, or saw Cujo, I, the movie's terrible, but I like the whole idea of let's say the dog taking control of the situation. In that particular case, the lobster taking control of the truck. And, and where the idea really, where the idea, it's a combination of Stephen King, and also I'm in Waterville, in one year in, in between uh, years in college, my brother and I worked at a place called Harris Bakery. Oh, yeah. And, and there was this guy, there was this guy who drove a tractor trailer of donuts into the ocean. He was on the loading dock and he was like, I drove that son of a bitch right into the water. <laughs> <laughs> you have seen it. I had donuts all over the place. <laughs> so I thought, well, donuts won't work. But, uh, so I thought, lobsters are a great way to go. And that guy, he's so, in, I just took that in. And it, and so I, it's a combination of that guy on the loading dock bragging about his track trailer going to the ocean and Stephen King. <laughs> so it's, it's a real, and, and, and the imagery is not necessarily even Maine either. It's, it's a combination of Connecticut, Maine, and Portland. So I, I really take from a lot of different places. And I love doing that. 
Yeah. Um, could you talk a little bit about the tree stump thing and, and this like dead tree? And yeah, well, you know, some of them are, you know, there's a lot of paintings here from different parts of my life, and I think it has to do uh, a lot with my dad's death, in a sense. Um, some of it, some of it. And also, there's just something, uh, that piece actually comes from uh, one time, we, we lived, I lived in Baltimore for 11 years, and we'd come up and see my mom, and she lives, she still lives in Eddington, but I took Matthew, my son, out one day on a super cold day. I mean, it was like 20 below, but we still, we went out on a, on a toboggan, and you remember that? And I took him out for a long, long time. They were starting to worry about us, but anyway. Um, I saw that stump out in the woods, and it just, it was just isolated and lonely, and I liked it. I, I can I can really relate to that part, sort of either the very kind of humorous stuff or the very kind of melancholy, kind of lonely, isolated uh, imagery like that. So it depends on what era, uh, you know, we're talking about. You know, this particular piece, uh, of Great American Pastime, uh, related to my father as well because he made a beautiful bat when he was in high school, uh, and I still have it. It's called a fungo mat. It's just a big pop balls. And I thought, hmm, uh, why not just have an homage to, to him, in a sense, uh, with a whittled out tree uh, based on, you know, that beautiful piece of object that I have. I only have a few objects of his, you know. So um, it, I think, you know, when you're 15 and your dad dies, it plays a huge role. And being an artist, I think that I can kind of express it in paint. Other people express those sorts of things in writing and music and you know all that sort of thing. So or I never expressed it at all. So. Any other questions? Yes sir. Yeah, I have a question just about the process. It sounds like a lot of your ideas are kind of brewing throughout your life. Yeah. And what when do you hit the tipping point when it has to become a pain? Right? Well Is yeah it ideas. Yeah, that's a great question. That's a that's a really great question. It it happens when I can't get it out of my head. Yeah, when it sticks with me for so long. Uh, I mean, I thought about that particular piece for the longest time. And um, actually, for a lot of these, when I'm laying in bed at night and I know that it's still there, I, you know, I, I have to paint it up at a certain point. I already have a canvas ready to go in the studio. Not a huge one, actually. Uh, so this, you know, I already know what I'm painting and I can't wait to, to get back in there and, and, and get it out, in a sense. And I think, too, that, you know, I have a lot of recurring themes, um, and, and, and they're just reinvented in a, certain, in a certain way. So maybe I'll never get it all off. You know what I mean? Hopefully, hopefully I won't. Any other questions? Yes. Do you have a from a dream? A dream? Um, not really. No, and I love the surrealists. I love that whole thing, but not specific dreams, per se. Uh, the natural world is crazy enough <laughs> without having to go from my dreams, which are even crazier. You know, so, Dennis? Hey, Ed, um, yeah. It's really got to be a different thing to paint large versus small. Yeah. So, like, what are your thoughts on that? Do you like one or the other, or what makes Oh, I, I, I love painting large. You know, uh, one of the problems with painting large, of course, is that people don't necessarily have a lot of room to put them in their living room. But, but it is, it is, uh, you know, I love dealing with a wall of paint, you know, and having just the brush uh, just move on the surface and layering and scratching in and, I mean, little ones, are, they're, they're really kind of intimate, but uh, there's just something about having a, a wall, what I call a wall of paint to confront that's challenging and I think at the same time really powerful and can talk to people. And I, and I think in this age of like, of movies, of cinema, you have to make really powerful paintings because we're competing with a huge... I mean, some people might not like the idea of comparing those two media, but I think movies have been very, very influential and maybe a little bit... Um, um, you know, it's cut into the purpose of what painting used to be, people, you know? Like Church, he, he, went to, he went to South America and did these amazing paintings of, like, the jungle, and then brought them back and painted them in galleries, and people would pay money to come in and see these amazing paintings of, of, of South America. And people could go to South America in you know, the mid-1800s, and so they were like the cinema of their time. So um, 
you know, it, it's it's a it's a complex question, good question, but I love I love the, the paint. Uh, they're also a lot harder to transport. <laughs> so, yeah. Need a bigger truck or a bigger car or something. So, any other questions? Yes, sir. I, I was just wondering. I mean, obviously you've had a very educational so you from Wick, and uh, so you really got your own kind of thing going on here. I was wondering where you kind of draw from that education and where you kind of make up your own sort of thing and have your own direction. Well, I think just by working a lot, just by painting as much as possible. Uh, by being uh, going within, you know, and also not being afraid of any kind of crazy idea, especially in these particular case, you know, paintings. I mean, things, you know, like combining the truck driver from Harris Bakery with Stephen King. You know, you just can't, it becomes a, it becomes a, it becomes almost a, like a mission for me um, to get that kind of idea done. And when I start developing it, then the process just starts taking on its own essence, and then I think people can sense the the, uh, the identity of of who I am. It's all process. Do you take photographs of areas and then look from photographs to come up with it, or is it just from your imagination? It's both. It's I I use I don't use a heck of a lot of photographs. I do some, um, uh, but I. I it depends on the situation. I tend to like to work from life absolutely as much as possible, and I tell my students that all the time. We're always forcing them to, to work from life. As a matter of fact, by drawing one class, I don't let anybody use photographs at all. Uh, because you really need to know how to use photographs. It's just another, they're just another tool. So I try to practice what I preach, in a sense. But every now and then, I, I need something. You know, I need, I need a photo to, to kind of, just as a reference, but, uh, some of these are just straight from painting. They just come, just come right out. A lot of sketching, a lot of planning. Yes. And I know you said in that one there that you um, didn't use any black paint. Right. Can no you black. talk a little bit about your your Chris painterly process? <laughs> <laughs> She's my compadre at the, at the university. She's the colorist right there. Um, and yeah, no, it's just combinations of complementary colors. And uh, various, um, well, when you work with complementary colors on the color wheel, uh, you can come up with some real range of darks, lights, and, and actually mid-tone grays that people would call, I mean, most people consider gray a mixture of black and white, but for artists, we consider it a mixture of, let's say, orange and blue in order to create grays that are way more interesting. And so uh, there, there is essentially no black in here. It also has to do with a lot of contrast. So then if I put, let's say, a sad green next to this white, it's going to appear to have that sense of, of, uh, of the blackness that people think really exists there. Is there another question? Do you always paint in oils? I love oils. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do use acrylics some. I have an acrostic over there, uh, the, the, uh, the stump up there, that's a, a wax painting, and I have a little hatchet painting here somewhere. Um, it's upstairs. That's in caustic as well. Uh, I love working with oil. I love working with wax. I love it all, to tell you the truth. But the paint of choice is oil for me for the most part. Uh, and Chris and I, we talk about it all the time because it's so rich. You put it, you make a mark with an oil painting, with oil paint, it stays put forever. Whereas acrylic paint, you have to add additives and, you know, it has a place, but it's, uh, it's it's not I don't think quite as rich and it's this kind of plasticky feel to it. So does that does that mix um, water based oil? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I'm a purist. I grew up in the day where turpentine was your friend. You know. <laughs> and you know what? There's so many. You can use uh, you can use oil paints now really safely without water soluble. Mm -hmm. They're fine for your class because you know there are laws that we can't use turp, but. But I, I, I don't even have a turf in my studio. So, and I use, it's all oil, so. What do you use for? Um, oh, now we get a technical. <laughs> Secret? Secret? Corn oil, it's a clean brush, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. to thin it. To thin uh, well, I, I, sometimes I use lip wind a little bit. You have to use walnut, walnut, 
I have these wall notes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And sometimes I use a third, third, and a third, and I just put a little turf. I don't mind a little turf in my studio. I don't have to worry about that. So if I use a third, third, and a third binder, I'll use a little turf, a little bit of stand oil, and a little bit of uh, Demar varnish. I love it. I'm, I'm kind of a purist in that sense. I love Whitwood. I think it's great stuff. It's great, great glazing. So. Um, at what point in your painting career did you really feel like you could branch out with color? Because the vibrancy in that painting versus that painting was very obvious. Yes. And was yeah. it Whitkin that kind of gave you well, that Well, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I mean, Samantha mentioned that too. She was looking at that painting. She was like, wow, the color is really popping out of this, you know. I don't know. It's just been process, just been process. And I also think that, uh, it's a great question, I also think teaching about color, too, over the last eight or ten years, has helped me re-examine how I use color. Uh, and I think that's probably the biggest, the biggest influence right but there. But were you ever in a place where well, you were afraid to go, you know, to no, go that no. next step, or what from No, you no, I don't think so. It? I mean, if you look at the piece behind Venice, the orchard up there, there's a lot of color in there, you know, uh, tons of color. And I like that. And if you look at the death of a young man uh, upstairs, it's tons of color. It's still a night painting. So I've used color a, a lot, a long time. I just think that um, the, the saturation level has changed in this particular piece. You know, there's a total different, totally different uh, association between the figures too. If you notice some of the older pieces, you're, you're very far away from from the, the people. And in this particular case, you're almost it's almost like a large TV. You know, you're right there. So technology has certainly influenced my work a lot. But I, you know, what's really funny is that I always thought that I used a lot of color until recently. So I, I think it's from teaching more than anything. Any other last minute? Uh, yes, sir. So now when you have these pictures in your head, and then you're about to uh, just put them onto a painting. Is there some sort of process you go through as far as in your mind focused and have you sort of developed a turn, on, turn on lots of law and order. <laughs> <laughs> I know Scott, you're disappointed, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> he wants to have Robert Burns. <laughs> no, I uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, you mean like process with, process with the actual paintings? Yeah, I guess sort of that gets you in the mode of Well first know. first of all, I, I do a lot of studies for a long time. I mean, I ask my students all the time, as you know, since you're one of my students, um, <laughs> that you need to do, a, I mean, it's a lot of repetition, repetition, repetition. It really doesn't change when you start doing this professionally. So I spend a lot of time figuring out how I want things placed uh, and, and um, do sketches in my sketchbook, figure out basic you know, ideas. And then I take, I take it to the bigger canvas, stretch the canvas. I'm really particular about my services that I work on. Some pieces are on some pieces are on panel. Some pieces are on canvas. Some pieces are on linen. Uh, linen happens to be one of those items that I you know buy when I have you know a flush wallet. You know it's really expensive stuff. It's beautiful to work on, but it, it really depends on which direction I want my work to go, which how I want the piece to look. So the surface is really important for me, uh, and uh, and then also and then I start building up layers of of uh, underpaintings. Sometimes I draw on the canvas and sometimes I don't. Depends on the painting, once again. So they all vary um, uh, from painting to painting as to how I take it. Now what about like a cup of coffee or music in the background? <laughs> Music's awesome, yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Coffee, wine, or, or and music. You know, all three, the wines. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on the evening. <laughs> and I tend to paint at night. I like painting at night for some reason. Uh, it's just, I need, I need, uh, and actually there was a time when uh, all, the, the encaustic painting on the end here, the little one, that's part of a series that I did uh, when my son was born, and I stayed home for three years with him. And uh, my wife went to work, and she, uh, I, I stayed at the house, and when he would take a nap, we'd go for, we'd walk the dog, and then he'd fall asleep, would say at nine in the morning or something. And he'd sleep for like two or three hours. I would run downstairs and do one of those little paintings, almost a painting a day. And, and then when he'd wake up, the beauty of encaustic paint waxes and you turn off the heat 
and they dry instantaneously. You know, there's no cleanup whatsoever. And so I ended up uh, uh, doing a whole bunch of those paintings. And at that time, that worked out perfectly for, for my lifestyle. Now I'm busy teaching and, you know, a whole bunch of things. So I have to, I like to set aside a day, let's say like Fridays, you know, I'm teaching necessarily. So I try to get into the studio then or, or at night after supper and everything. I work for three or four hours till midnight or something. Um, so it really, I work with, I mean, even Matisse took a break, play the fiddle and, you know, work with his doves and that sort of thing. You gotta take, some people think you have to paint like around the clock. I think you need to take a little time off, too. So. Yeah. Yes? Since, particularly this exhibition, your paintings tell stories in your process for prepping for it, do you ever write the stories that you play on painting? Well, that's what she asked, sort of. I, 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 I don't necessarily, you know? And that could probably tie into the dream question, in a sense. I like to let that kind of, kind of craziness just let things happen, you know? I don't want it to be too concrete. I don't want these to necessarily be illustrations, you know, because they could come off as looking like illustrations, which I've thought of before. I'm not a, I'm not a very good illustrator. I'm not great at, like, if someone says, hey, go, you know, I have a book to be done, can you do this? And uh, it's too confining for me. So I, I don't know if I would ever write it. I would write them down after the fact, but not before. It's interesting, yeah. Yes? One of the latest crazy things bouncing around in your head from the newspapers, locally, the state of Maine, because I got a bunch of it in my head, and I'm not an artist. <laughs> yeah, I'm what, just wondering. What do I have in there? Yeah, what, what's in <laughs> there? <laughs> You'll never run out of material. No, 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 no there's no shortage of material yeah. in this state. Um, no, I mean, I, I actually, you, can, you might find this kind of funny. I don't like to talk about that that much. Okay, that's it. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like being a baseball player. You know, you just, I kind of superstition in a sense. If I, I want to get it out on the canvas. Um, and then, you know, I have things brewing all the time. Um, and who knows where the, where the work will go. But uh, you'll, you'll see them eventually. <laughs> yes. Do you attribute your kind of uh, humor to your French Canadian upbringing? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm always horsing around. <laughs> yeah, this this humor. Yeah, yeah don't, don't we all need humor? But it's it's really a particular sense of humor. I'm French Canadian. Oh, you are. Yeah. You I grew up in Quebec City. Oh, you did. Okay. So you think I it's really in this kind of humor, which is. Yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, I mean, my mom's were a family of 11 kids, yeah. so it's big, and speak French, and you have to have a sense of humor to survive that plan. She's done, she's done all right, you know, so. But yeah, I think there is a certain sense of humor, but I try not to. It's an unusual sense of humor. Yeah, I, th I think, I mean, I'm from here, you know, but people are actually surprised that I'm from Maine. Um, I'm from Waterville. Do they think I'm from Lewiston? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so um, it doesn't matter. It's still a French mill town, so it's almost the same thing. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, I'd like to thank Ed for the talk. And, uh...